Hi, it's your friendly ex-Muslim. So we often hear that Islam is the cleanest religion, that this is something Muslims are proud of, that Islam teaches amazing hygiene, that Islam is more superior and that non-Muslims are like dirty compared to Muslims because Muslims wash all the time, right? Supposedly, there's a wudu, the washing up, which you do before praying, there's, there's this shower you take after, you know, having sex. There's a lot of examples of things like that, which make you think that, hey, maybe Islam is actually very clean. Let's take a look at the actual teachings of Muhammad and the actual actions of Muhammad regarding this, and let's see if this matches to what we are told. Let's get into it. So first we have here, this is sunnah.com. This is a website that has hadith collections on it. And this one is Sunan of Ibn Majah, where Anas narrated that the Prophet used to go around to all his wives with one bath. So what that means is he used to sleep with one of his wives, have sex with them, and then go to another one, and then go to another one, and then go to another one, all of them, without taking a bath in between. Right? It says the chapter heading. The chapter heading here is the interpretation of the scholar that made the book. One who has one bath after being intimate with all his wives. So that's not exactly clean uh, doing this. Right? So already we're starting to see that the narrative that we were taught is not correct. The requirements are not as strict as people would think. And here's another example, right? where the Messenger of Allah, it says, used to have sexual intercourse with his wives with one single bath. And this is in Sahih Muslim, right? And the Sahih, the Imam Muslim said it's impermissible for one was Janab, basically the state you're in, the, the spiritual state you're in after intercourse, to sleep, but it's recommended for him to perform wudu and wash his private parts if he wants to eat, drink, sleep, or have intercourse. So that's interesting. So it's the Imam is actually adding an interpretation that says it's recommended for him to to wash his private parts if he wants to eat or drink or sleep or have intercourse, which is interesting, right? But again, do we see any teachings about cleanliness here or is this more a spiritual thing, right? Because what I'm reading, what it appears to be the, what appears to be the case is that this is all about your spiritual sense, right? You're spiritually, you know, janab, which is you're impure after having sex and you have to ritually wash yourself, right? And the, the, the proof for this is that when you, when you wash yourself after intercourse, you're actually washing your entire body, including the hair on your head, including your, like, and, and for example, for a woman, Right? It would be like if she has long hair, she'd have to like wash all of her hair. Right? Even if she's out traveling or something, or she just took a shower 15 minutes before. I mean, realistically, practically speaking, all you need to do is wash your private parts. Right? Not your ha hair on your head. Right? Your hair on your head is unaffected by you having sex. <laughs> but Islam says you have to do all this. Right? So it, again, it's not about practical cleanliness. It's about spiritual or... Frankly speaking, it's a sort of OCD, right? I mean, it appears that Muhammad had some traits of obsessive compulsive, that like he wanted to do these things to always be pure, right? Here's another one. He went around all his wives and only performed ghusl, which is a bath, once. And this is Sunan Nasai. Okay? Again, in, in this hadith book, it says exactly the same thing. He used to have intercourse with his wives one after another with a single bathing. Okay, now we get to a different topic. Now we get to some practical advice from the Prophet, right? So the chapter heading is an najasat, meaning impure and filthy things which fall in cooking butter or ghee, right? And water. So the messenger, Allah's messenger was asked regarding ghee in which a mouse had fallen. He said, take out the mouse and throw away the ghee around it and use the rest. So here we have a mouse fell into your butter, right? And for some reason, they're asking Chef Muhammad what to do about this, right? And I mean, it's not like they didn't know what to do with 
mice and like like i'm sure they could have figured it out it's not like he knew what he was talking about anyways <laughs> he said take away the part with the mouse in it i mean i hope to god the mouse didn't take a poop in there right because you're talking about getting very sick right at this point um if there was any sort of like we, how would you even know that the mouse stayed in that one side right like you know any one of us found a mouse in the food we'd throw the entire thing out we wouldn't want to get sick right why risk it but apparently this is his advice now Practical reality is maybe the food was, you know, maybe they needed to do this. But then why are you asking the prophet? Like you don't need your prophet to tell you that. Like this is a religious ruling, right? Anytime they went to the prophet, this is like a religious thing, right? Practical, I don't see it as really practical. I mean, maybe to some extent if you had no choice and you were starving or whatever, that's a different story. But you don't need the prophet to tell you that then, right? And here's another one. A mouse, wow, this one's even worse. A mouse fell into the butter fat and died. So you have a dead mouse in your butter. Just sounds so delicious. Like mouse butter. Ugh. <laughs> the prophet was asked about that. He said, throw away the dead mouse, the mouse, and the butter fat around it and eat the rest of the butter fat. <laughs> this is inside Bukhari. Yeah, this is not really clean. Okay. I would have liked to see if you have no choice, then eat it. Like this, this is like really bad advice in general. You, you're talking about a dead mouse that's potentially, potentially rotting in your food and you're still going to eat from that food. Gross. Now we get to the discussion about flies. Narrated, it was narrated from Abu Sa'id al-Qudri. The Prophet said, if a fly falls into the vessel of one of you, let him dip it in. Dip it in. Okay. Another hadith in this collection says, when a fly falls into a drink, you should dip it and throw away and throw it away because there's disease in one of the wings and cure in another. And this is in Bukhari. So this is saying like your fly fell in your drink. So what would be like sensible advice? Okay. Flies are disgusting. They, they land on poop, feces, animal feces, who knows what else, right? And they spread disease. And apparently he knows this too. He said they, one of its wings has a disease. They spread disease, not just the wing, the entire body, right? And what would be sensible advice? You just throw out the drink, right? What's the ridiculous advice we have here? Dip it. Dip it, dip it, dip it. No, no, that doesn't make any sense. And then you're drinking it. And then, oh, well, you dip it and you're not done yet. After dipping it, you, you have to take it out. And then you drink it. <laughs> Because there's a cure in the wing. Okay, that makes literally no sense. Okay. Uh, same thing again here. Okay. Same thing again here. Same nonsense. Okay. So now we get to some interesting other stories of the Prophet. It's a native of Anas being Malik that the Prophet went to sl sleep to lay down and he was sweating. Um Sulaim got up and collected his sweat and put it in a bottle. The Prophet said, what are you doing, o Um Sulaim? She said, I'm putting your sweat in my perfume. And he smiled. What a creepy guy. He wants his followers to be using his sweat as perfume. And this is considered like sanitary. Gross. Taking a grown man's sweat and rubbing it on your body. This is not, I mean, he's smiling. Like, this is, is this cleanliness? Now, we have another example of this, where, same hadith, basically, where she's explaining that he was sweating when cold, when the revelation came, and then, you know, while he was sweating profusely, uh, so this is, this is like some special sweating, I guess. <laughs> she used to collect his sweat and put it in, his, in a perfume bottle. Again, very cult-like behavior and not very really sanitary or clean. Now, here's another question. They asked the Prophet, can we perform wudu from the well of Buddha, which is a well where menstrual clothes, dead dogs, and stinking things were thrown? He replied, water is pure and is not defiled by anything. Sunan of Abu Dawood, graded Sahih by Sheikh Al-Albani. So we're talking about a well that has tampons, or <laughs> not tampons, basically like wet like wipes from people's um, menstrual blood women's menstrual blood it's all thrown in there then on top of it dead dogs and stinking things meaning trash and they're like 
drinking this, not drinking, but the, like sucking up the water into the nose and mouth and gargling with it and rubbing it all over the face and arms and legs. And this is considered a good thing. Is this prophet really teaching about cleanliness here? Again, the message I'm trying to get here, which is very, very obvious to whoever doesn't get it by now. None of this is about cleanliness. It's all about some sort of mental illness that he had, right? Some, some issue where he had to be spiritually, you know, doing this and that because he thought that this is the, the way you need to be or whatever. Next one. When a dog drinks out of your vessel, he must wash it seven times. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, there's no discussion about soap or anything like that. Again, it's, it's this weird number seven, wash it seven times. You don't need to wash a dish seven times if a dog drinks from it. You wash it one time properly, right? Not seven times. That's just, again, it's ridiculous. And it says, um, okay, this one's not relevant. Okay, now we get to, this is kind of a weird one. This is super weird. I don't even know what this is about. The pr Prophet came to the grave of Abdul bin Ubay, brought him out, placed him on his knee, and put his saliva in his mouth. So he took his spit and put it in a dead guy's mouth. And this was one of the hypocrites too. It's like, what the heck is going on here? Okay, so here's one more where the Prophet was taking a bath from a large bowl. And, sorry, here's another hadith where one of the wives of the Prophet took a bath from a large bowl, right? And he wanted to wudu or use the leftover water. She said, oh, Messenger of Allah, I was sexually defiled, meaning I'm washing my body after I had sex. And he said, water is not defiled, meaning he's using the leftover body, water that she washed herself with after having sex with all of her, you know, um, flu fluids or whatever were being washed out in the sweat and the dirt or whatever. And he was using that water for wudu in his nose and mouth and he was saying it's fine, it's fine. I was like, what? And here's another quite interesting one that I, Aisha used to rub off the, the semen from the clothes of the Prophet, right? And then he would pray in it. She would have to rub it off. He was going around with clothes with semen on it until time to pray. His wife would have to wash it, right? And she used to scrape the, the wetness off his clothes in another hadith that says the same thing, right? So he was going around with basically stained up clothes, right? And his wife had to wash it, his child wife, right? This hadith is like insanity where people got sick and then he told them to drink the urine of camels, right? This is like nuts. It's just nuts. You can get sick, really sick from that, right? This is a kind of weird one where we have this example of how women, a girl's urine and a boy's urine are treated differently. Uh, a girl's urine should be washed away, but with the boy, you just sprinkle water on it. It's kind of strange. It's almost like he thinks that, you know, the, the pee of a girl is worse than the pee of a guy. And here's one more example of the same thing where it's like you're treating girl urine different from guy urine, which is weird, right? Like, why would you just sprinkle water on a guy's one but not a girl's one? It's it's strange. So so that's all I have. I think this is a good example to show that Islam is never was about cleanliness. It's about ritual purity, which is a made up thing, right? It's about Muhammad's own insecurity about being pure or whatever and always needing to wash and always needing to do things seven times and three times, even the wudu, right? Wash your hands three times, wash your face three times, wash your arms three times. Like none of this has anything to do with cleanliness. It's not. It's just about, it's rituals. Muhammad was, his brain, his mind was, was doing these things to him. He wanted to, you know, this, this gave him a sense of satisfaction. And now we have billions of people imitating this as if it came from God. Thinking that this is some sort of pure, clean ritual. It's all ritualistic nonsense. It's nothing to do with cleanliness. And you can see that having sex with multiple wives without washing, using leftover water from, from taking a shower or a bath for wudu, for, clean, for doing ablutions, you know, like eating from food that a, like a mouse fell in or dipping flies in drink or even prescribing urine of a, of a camel to drink. Like none of these things make sense. None of them are about purity or cleanliness. None of this stuff is good for humanity. But this is what this is the legacy we have of Muhammad and Islam. So I hope you see that Islam is not about cleanliness. It never was. None of these things make sense. 
and we are much better without it. Thanks for watching. Thank you to my patrons and those who continue to support me on YouTube and otherwise I do appreciate your support and I'm going to continue making videos. This is your friendly ex-Muslim Abdullah Samir signing out.